With multiple new and inspiring movie directors to even some Oscar nominations, horror movies are back and they're no longer just the bottom of the barrel when it comes to filmmaking, and a large part of that is due to Mike Flanagan. With one of the most impressive filmographies of all recent horror movie directors, Mike Flanagan has touched a realm that most other directors haven't when it comes to horror, and that's television. Not only has he created four different shows for Netflix, but he's directed some of the most underrated horror movies of the past decade. Oculus was and is one of the best horror movies I've ever seen, along with Hush, which is easily one of the most suspenseful movies I'd probably say ever made. He's also a frequent adapter of Stephen King's works with Gerald's Game, a great film with a scene that I literally had to look away from the screen, and a sequel to a little-known movie called The Shining. Don't know if you've heard of it, but yeah, Mike Flanagan made the sequel to it called Dr. Sleep. As impressive as his filmography is, in this video I want to go over his Netflix TV shows. With four shows under his belt and another one on the way, I wanted to take a look back at all of Mike Flanagan's shows, talk about how great they work as TV shows, give my review and ranking of them all, and also talk a little bit about his upcoming show, The Fall of the House of Usher. These four shows I'm talking about are The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, and The Midnight Club. Mike Flanagan has a variety of different titles when it comes to these shows, from writer, director, producer, and creator, so let's look at the first show in which he wears all of these hats, The Haunting of Hill House. While the show only came out back in 2018, the book of the same name actually came out in 1959 and was written by Shirley Jackson. This isn't the first time this story has been adapted, it's far from it actually, because it's also been made into two other movies, one in 1963 and one in 1999 both of them simply titled The Haunting. While the show was met with overwhelmingly positive reviews, the two movies weren't as fortunate, and while these are all an adaptation of Shirley Jackson's book, the plots are actually vastly different from one another. In the 1963 film, a small group of people are invited to Hill House by a paranormal investigator to investigate the haunted house, while the 1999 film, which stars Liam Neeson, Owen Wilson, and Catherine Zeta-Jones, go into Hill House to do a volunteer study on insomnia. Though because it's Hill House, things don't exactly go as planned. In the show, we follow the Crane family both as children and adults, and how their history all ties back into Hill House in some way or another. So if all these adaptations are based on the same book, why are they so vastly different from one another? Which one is the most faithful to the book? They all have certain aspects that stay true to the books, but the most accurate one would probably be the 1963 version. But Mike Flanagan took on the task of adapting this book for modern audiences while staying true to the core theme of the book, and he delivered what is probably the best horror TV show in recent memory, but maybe even of all time. Like I said, the Netflix show follows the Crane family, specifically the kids, throughout their childhood in Hill House and their adult lives, where they're still haunted in their own specific ways. Hill House follows a structure that a lot of shows try to do nowadays, but just about none of them do it as well as Hill House did. Each of the first five episodes represents each of the five children, allowing us a closer look at each of their lives, what they went through as kids, and what they're going through as adults. Not only does this format give us a closer look at each character, but it also allows the mystery to build throughout each episode. Some of the kids have different recounts of events because some of them were there for certain things, and others weren't. These mysteries and twists play off in some of the greatest ways possible, and most of the time it makes you forget that this is even a horror show until something scary happens. So when the scares do come, they really get you because you're invested in this world and the characters, and that's something that you really can't accomplish too often in an hour and a half movie. At the end of the fifth episode, we've gone through each episode with one of the children, and then we see an episode of all the children as adults together again for the first time on screen. 
Not only has this moment been building up for such a long time, so the payoff is great, but this is also one of the most technically impressive episodes of television I've ever seen. The first time I watched this episode, I was like eight or nine minutes in when I realized that this had all been one continuous tracking shot. But just to be sure, I rewatched the first nine minutes, and since then, I've seen this episode a number of times just because of how impressive it really is. But after this episode, there's still mysteries left to be solved regarding both the adults, the house, and the past, and the last couple episodes answers all of those questions while also giving us a satisfying ending that leaves a couple things up in the air. If you don't know what I'm talking about and you've seen the show, there's a theory that none of the kids actually made it out of the house alive. All of these flashes to the future are actually still taking place in the house in the Red Room. There's lots of evidence to both support this theory and go against it, so it's definitely open to the viewer for interpretation. And that's one of the things I really like about this ending. If you're looking for a happy ending, then you have it, but if you're looking for a darker and more depressing ending, then you also have that. That's not something a lot of stories can pull off successfully, it's usually just one or the other, but the fact that Hill House gives you both is really impressive. Speaking of theories, there's also plenty of others that remain after the credits roll, and my absolute favorite theory, partly because of how insane it is, but also because it's semi-plausible, is that the house isn't haunted at all, and the Crane family is only seeing things because of the black mold in the walls. I won't get too in-depth about this one, but it's certainly a theory that keeps people guessing. This series, as well done as it is, I really think that Mike Flanagan was the only person who could ever bring it to justice. Not only is the structure of the episodes and the pacing fantastic, but the scares and technical elements that go into the show were only made possible because of him. He brought this story that came out in 1959 and modernized it both in terms of its story but its storytelling, giving people mysteries that keep them intrigued throughout its runtime, and theories for after the credits roll that keeps the story alive even though it's just a single season of television. I know I talked about how great episode 6 was on a technical level, but throughout the show there's there's so many different ghosts that are hiding in the background, some of them are a bit more obvious than others, and some of the statues in the house move between shots, even in episode 6 where it's a continuous shot. This series is as close to horror perfection you can get. I've rewatched the series about four times now, one of them recently so that way I could write this video, and now in the process of actually writing it, I want to go and rewatch it again. This show easily gets like a 9.5 out of 10 in my book. I have very few issues with the show, so few that I think it's a disservice to even talk about them because of how little they truly matter. So after Hill House, Netflix and fans were very eager to see what was in store for us, and that leads us to Bly Manor. Once again, Bly Manor is an adaptation, this time of Henry James's 1898 novella The Turn of the Screw. While this is mainly an adaptation of The Turn of the Screw, it also has a lot of other references to Henry James's other works. The Turn of the Screw itself has had so many different adaptations, I'm talking like more than 30 movies and shows, all of them with different names, so I won't even bother getting into it, but in terms of The Haunting of Bly Manor, it's actually a very faithful adaptation with a few different changes for the modern day audiences. Bly Manor maintains a lot of the same names and plot as The Turn of the Screw, and it's actually a more faithful adaptation than The Haunting of Hill House was, but that doesn't necessarily make it better either. If anything, The Haunting of Bly Manor feels a lot like The Haunting of Hill House 2.0. It does a lot of the things that Hill House did, with the twists and the hidden ghosts in the background, but not nearly as clever as Hill House did. The soundtrack by the Newton Brothers is fantastic for sure, but also the exact same as Hill House's with only minor tweaks. This doesn't really help add to the story in any way, in fact I think it actually takes more away than anything because the music is just reminding me of Hill House the entire time and how invested I was in that story and how casually interested I am with Bly. There's still lots of clever twists, kind of, but I also found these twists to be rather obvious in comparison to Hill House. There's a character that you find out has been dead and really a ghost the whole time, but when the time comes for that reveal and explanation, I really saw it coming from a mile away. Talking about ghosts though, I think that how possession works and the rules surrounding it are done super well in this show. The unique world building definitely makes this stand out from any other possession stories, and I know I'm being a bit hard on this show, I will say right now this is not a bad show. It's not even a bad show in comparison to Hill House, it's just definitely the weaker of the two. 
And I know they're two different shows, but it's hard not to compare them directly, especially when Bly Manor wants to essentially be Hill House 2.0. There's also this overarching story about how the entire events of the show is a different story being told at someone's wedding. Now, full spoilers ahead if you haven't seen the show. Three, two, one. Alright, it's treated like it's some big reveal that this wedding is Flora's and the person telling the story is Jamie, and I'm not too sure why that is. You see all these characters that perfectly match up with the characters' ages in the story if they were a bit older, yet it's this big reveal that, oh wow, it's actually all of them grown up. This also makes me wonder why older Jamie was telling this 9 hour story to all these people, most of whom were already there. Then there's the most confusing aspect, how Flora, or whatever her name is because apparently Flora is her middle name, has no clue what she's talking about at all. I know it was said that the kids forgot about all the ghostliness at Bly Manor, but they still have memories. They would still remember that they had an au pair taking care of them, they would remember Miss Jessel and Peter, yet they let this lady drag this story on the night before their wedding, and after the story is over, Flora asks to give this person a hug like she has no idea who it is. Did you not invite this person? Do you think this is just some random person who showed up at your wedding to tell a 9 hour campfire story? It was small things like this that were really all throughout the show and kind of took me out of the story a bit. Maybe I just wasn't paying full attention because I wasn't as captivated, but the storyline got very confusing at times and not even in a mysterious way, I was just left wondering why this character said this or why this character did that, because it didn't make any narrative sense. That might be a nitpick, I could very well be wrong and everything was there for a reason, but it just felt a bit jumbled to me. While I said the structure of Hill House was fantastic, the structure of Bly Manor didn't really keep me invested in the story. I know that this is another adaptation, and in the turn of the screw, there's someone also retelling a story about Bly Manor, but it is just so far-fetched to me that I really had trouble grasping onto some of the plots in this show. Like I said before, it's not a bad show, it's still miles better than like most other horror TV shows, but it was kinda a swing and a miss in my opinion. For what it's worth, Mike Flanagan created this series, but he only directed and wrote a single episode. Did this mean that he wasn't fully in charge of some of the story decisions? Absolutely, and does this mean that if he were fully in charge it would have turned out maybe even just slightly better? Absolutely, I definitely think it would. So overall, I'd give The Haunting of Bly Manor a 7.5 out of 10. But Flanagan's next project was something else entirely. It wasn't going to be Hill House 3.0, it wasn't going to be an adaptation, it was going to be his own original work, and that brings us to Midnight Mass. Midnight Mass was Flanagan's most personal work he had ever done, and it still is to this day. It brings in his own experiences with religion and addiction, and gives them both a frightening twist. While Midnight Mass was made for the screen, it actually has a pretty extensive history in the Mike Flanagan universe, or the Flanaverse. In Flanagan's 2016 film Hush, the main character, played by Kate Siegel, who's been in all of these shows so far, huh? I wonder why that is. Oh, that's why. Anyways, she's writing a book in this film, a book called Midnight Mass. In another one of Flanagan's films, Gerald's Game, the character throws a book. A book called Midnight Mass. Flanagan originally envisioned Midnight Mass as a film, then a TV show that he pitched in 2014, and every network, including Netflix, passed on it. Given his success with both Hill House and Bly Manor, Netflix gave him the green light to do Midnight Mass in 2021. While it is very different from his previous two shows, Midnight Mass still feels very much like a Mike Flanagan production, obviously because it is, but a lot of the newer elements that he added in the other two adaptations are present here. Midnight Mass is filled with mystery and intrigue. You're presented with lots of different questions along the way, you're given a few answers here and there, but a lot of great twists. I think that the mystery presented in Midnight Mass is just as great as Hill House's, which is a nice return to form after Bly Manor, which I didn't think was as great as Hill House. One of the ways that Midnight Mass differs from both Hill House and Bly Manor, and subsequently the thing that a lot of people don't like about this show, are the monologues. This show has tons and tons of conversations, more conversations that could be in place of other scares or mysteries, and I get why some people are turned off by this. By the end of the series, I also had this feeling of, okay, just just get on with it, just get, 
get out what you're trying to say already. Right again and again and again and again and again and again and on into eternity. No one actually talks like this and it's bringing me out of it. But for the first couple episodes, I think that every conversation is fantastic. They have me at the edge of my seat and each and every conversation adds to the mystery that's presented or obviously enhances the characters. And that's definitely welcome because the characters in this show are great. I don't think that Hamish Linkletter gets enough credit for his performance as Father Paul. He was nominated for a few small awards, but nothing major, and I think that's absolutely ridiculous, because this might be the best performance of any actor across any of Mike Flanagan's works. Before I get too much further into the storyline and the mystery, I have to talk about a very big spoiler aspect to this show, so if you haven't seen the show, I'll put a time card on screen so that way you can skip this section. Alright, here we go. My absolute favorite aspect of this story is that there are actual scary vampires, just for once. None of these handsome jerks with fangs, but genuinely terrifying looking vampires. While these vampires do have traits of other vampires that we've seen before, they're all enhanced, such as their healing powers, having absolutely wondrous capabilities like restoring age and bone structure. And before it's revealed that there's a vampire, this gives a lot of opportunity for mystery, and a lot of these opportunities are explored with Father Paul and who he really is, how this girl can walk now, and why the old people in town are starting to look younger again. It's all incredibly well done, and it utilizes vampires to enhance its storytelling, which is just so smart. These vampires also see lights differently, and they do definitely burn in the sun. This is used in a horrific scene that I have to mute every time I watch it because Kate Siegel's screams are just too real for me to hear. Above all else, I think Midnight Mass is a commentary on how extreme beliefs can become. No matter what the truth of the matter is, if your mind is twisted and warped by whatever it is you believe, it can lead you down a really dark path, and using religion as a metaphor for that is quite appropriate, I think. I don't think it quite reaches the heights of Hill House, but I do think that it does a better job at setting up its mystery and explanations for the events that are going on than Bly Manor did, so I'm going to give Midnight Mass an 8.7 out of 10. And the most recent Mike Flanagan project drops the mass and adds club, and also goes back to his adapting roots with The Midnight Club. With The Midnight Club, Mike Flanagan adapted the Christopher Pike novel of the same name. While the show is mainly an adaptation of The Midnight Club, it's also an adaptation of several of other Pike's novels as well. And while usually this is a bad sign when it comes to adaptations, it actually works really well in this show. The Midnight Club is about a group of terminally ill teens who gather at midnight to tell scary stories. These scary stories that the teens are all telling are loose tellings of Pike's other novels. This is not only a great way to introduce and therefore reference the other books, but it also allows some great commentary about the horror genre itself. In the first episode, we're hearing of a scary story that ends with a jump scare. One of the teens says that jump scares are lazy, but since this isn't his story, it continues with plenty of other jump scares, and then also a fake jump scare with a black cat. All of these stories contain little moments like this that are a lapse in the horror storytelling format, and it calls attention to just how similar most horror movies are. This also speaks to Flanagan's ability to call out these horror tropes, poke fun at them, but also have them be pretty great as well. One of the aspects about the Midnight Club that I really liked is this sense of impending doom. These kids are all sick and dying, and with the many different twists and turns the show gives, it seems that doom can come sooner rather than later. The setting itself in Brightcliff, which is also the same house from Lock and Key, fun fact, is really great and separates itself greatly from other teenage horror shows because of how horrific the situation truly is. These kids are dying, and they're trying everything they can not to die, turning to supernatural or outside forces just for a string of hope, and it's very depressing. The Midnight Club also sets up far more threads than it pays off. I think this was certainly a show that Mike Flanagan saw potential for another season, so not everything was answered, and it won't be either because The Midnight Club was cancelled. Even after a plot twist and cliffhanger of an ending, like most new shows nowadays, Netflix cancelled it. Could this have gone on to be a great show? Yeah, maybe. Was this a great show after a single season? It definitely has its merit, but ultimately I think The Midnight Club was a failed experiment, in more ways than one. 
Just like Bly Manor, Flanagan wasn't the director or writer of every single episode like he was with Hill House and Midnight Mass, so did this series also suffer from a lack of cohesion? Yes, it definitely did. I wasn't nearly as captivated by these characters or the events that I was with any of the previous three shows, even Bly Manor. Would I have liked to see more of The Midnight Club? Possibly. I wouldn't be craving to watch a new season, but if I got around to it, I'd probably give it a shot. The Midnight Club aims high, probably higher than any of the previous shows, but it ultimately falls short. I'd give The Midnight Club like a 6 out of 10. Now this lands us at Mike Flanagan's upcoming show, and his last show to be made with Netflix before he moves on to Amazon, and I really don't blame him for that, and it's another adaptation, this time of a story by Edgar Allan Poe, called The Fall of the House of Usher. We don't have a trailer for it yet, but we do have the casting, and as you'd expect, Mike Flanagan likes to use his same actors, so we'll be seeing Carlo Gugino, Zach Guilford, Henry Thomas, Michael Trucco, Kate Siegel, Bruce Greenwood, Rahul Kohli, and among many other faces both new and recognizable, as well as some guy named Mark Hamill? Don't really know who that is, but Edgar Allan Poe's short story is about an unnamed narrator going into the house of his friend Roderick Usher, where it's revealed that Roderick's sister Madeline is ill and not quite alive or dead, and that's all I'll say on the matter. The Fall of the House of Usher is set to premiere on Netflix sometime in 2023. We don't quite have a date yet, or maybe you're watching this video in the future and you were expecting me to cover this show. Like I said before, The Fall of the House of Usher is going to be Mike Flanagan's last show with Netflix, as he's just signed a deal over at Amazon to start making content with them. This is great for Flanagan, and awful for Netflix. Netflix has already been taking some huge hits lately, and losing Mike Flanagan isn't being talked about enough. He's made four shows and will end up making five. All of them so far have been some of the best stuff that has been made on the platform, and losing a creator like Flanagan is terrible news for Netflix. But for the man himself, if Amazon's gonna treat him better, then by all means, head over there. There's some pretty substantial rumors that Flanagan will be adapting Stephen King's The Dark Tower books into a series there, and if that's true, this could be a very big show and make Mike Flanagan a household name. Time will tell, but whatever Flanagan decides to make next, I know I'll be watching. Overall, Mike Flanagan is one of my personal favorite directors and really one of the best horror directors working today. If you haven't seen one or more of these shows, you should really check them out. I try not to get too deep into spoiler territory for these kinds of videos, just in case you, yes, you watching this, haven't seen one or two or all of them. All of these shows are worth watching, they may not all be on the same level as Hill House, but they will all definitely satisfy your horror itch. And if you've seen these shows, you should check out Flanagan's other horror movies. I haven't actually seen them all, so I'm going to listen to my own advice and go watch one. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you like this video, you should check out my video on the Conjuring universe right here. Yeah.